Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today's Sunday, June 23rd, and this is the weekly market update. So, in this week's reality check, I want to talk about the gold breakout. I, I put that with italics with my fingers when I say that. The big news and the, uh, the big uh, thing that happened this week is gold has supposedly broken out and we're now in a new gold bull market and we are going to all-time highs. I mean, that's what I've been reading from a lot of pundits and what I call gold perma bulls. And just for some perspective, I wanted to throw this chart up there of the continuous gold contract. And you will note that uh, for, for a breakout, I mean, it's more of like barely broke out. I mean, we've, we've we crossed the $1,400 threshold, then we kind of came back. And, you know, this chart goes back to before 2015, and we've, we've seen so-called breakouts before. So I'm not saying this isn't a gold breakout. I'm not saying this isn't the gold breakout. But what I would like to see is for this price to pull back, because uh, it's oversold right now on relative strength, I'd like to see the gold price pull back. And back and fill some and then if it moves higher and reconfirms this breakout then I would be more inclined to believe it's a breakout and one of the reasons why I don't think this is necessarily the breakout if you will uh, let me you know couch these statements by saying I own gold I do own some gold royalty and streaming companies I am bullish long term on gold but in the short medium term I'm not sure if this is the beginning of the new bull market and the reason why is the U.S. dollar. Um, it's a pretty known fact that the U.S. dollar and gold trade inversely. That means when the dollar is going up, gold's usually going down. Dollar goes down, gold usually goes up. And this is, you know, for us that believe gold is money, uh, this makes perfectly perfect sense. It's a competing currency, uh, so gold would have a tendency to go down if one of the competitors, the U.S. dollar, its primary competitor, is going up. So um, let's talk about why the dollar may not be breaking down. I know there's a lot of people out there that are dollar negative, but in the short and medium term, I tend to be dollar positive. I'm not saying it's going to go on to a bull market, but there are conditions that lead me to believe that the dollar is not ready to implode yet. And why? what is that? Well, number one, you know, on a relative basis uh, on its competitors, the euro, the Japanese yen, and even the emerging Chinese renminbi, I mean, the U.S. dollar has a interest rate advantage. What I mean by that is if you buy U.S. government bonds or debt, you know, you're getting a anywhere from two to two and a half, something like that percent return. Uh, I'm not saying that's the best return, but uh, when you look at a lot of other countries, and this is a chart that shows central banks with negative rates, you know, where else are you going to go? Are you going to go to the ECB? Are you going to go buy German uh, debt? There's there's something like $13 trillion in sovereign debt out there with negative interest rates. So the U.S. dollar is such a large market. U.S. Do, uh, economy, such a large economy, can absorb capital inflows. Right now, there's a positive interest rate correlation with major other world economies that has a tendency to pull capital into the United States. <clears throat> when you're exchanging euros or yen to buy U.S. treasuries, you have to convert it to dollars. That creates a demand for dollars, hence the dollar index uh, goes up. You know, the other thing is that... Uh, Although we may be in a slowdown in the economy, our economy is performing a lot better than most of the other major world economies. Um, that has a tendency to also put upward pressure on the dollar. And I just, I just don't see this. It doesn't, it just, it doesn't have any sense to it in my mind. Now, that's not to say this isn't the breakout. It could very easily, um, the price of gold could easily backfill and then take off. But uh, I want to see, you know, some backing and filling and another confirmation of the move higher before I get on board with this so-called new bull market. 
You know, it's interesting that people are so desperate, especially in the um, perma bowls like Peter Schiff and these type of guys. I mean, they just jump all over this stuff. So, you know, I like to look at the facts. Um, I do believe that commodities are historically undervalued. I believe the entire commodity complex is going to move higher. Gold will be part of that uh, over the years as uh, money is printed. You know, for an example, we had, uh, I said, an uh, exchange on Twitter with some uh, Jethro's and bleacher bums. Some young gal was jumping up and down, gleefully clapping her hands together about the fact that Bernie Sanders said that he was going, part of his platform was to forgive college loan debt. And, uh, you know, I try to point out to people, where are you going to get the money for this? The, you know, the, the economy is, or the, the, the federal debt is, you know, $21 trillion. We're running almost trillion dollar deficits now. I mean, in order to do a lot of these things, you would have to issue a whole bunch more debt. There's no one who's going to buy this debt at some point. You know, you see the Federal Reserve monetizing it. And I do think that although I'm, uh, although I'm short term and medium term, maybe not bullish on gold, I can see the change starting to happen in the zeitgeist where we're talking about having interest rate cuts by the Fed. And this could be, a, you know, weak for the dollar. So the U.S. dollar has a lot of negative things hanging around it. But the timing of those events and how they will affect the dollar are hard to determine. So I do believe that people should own gold in bullion form. I have it uh, cached in a secure location. I view it as insurance against history and monetary deprivation by politicians. But uh, do I think this is the next great bull market rate to start in gold? I'm not sure. Uh, I just wanted to point that out. I just don't see it with the dollar uh, not breaking down yet. Uh, we need to see a dollar breakdown. I just don't see the catalyst for a dollar breakdown uh, currently. But there's been there's been times before where gold has moved higher and the dollar has moved higher. So you got you got to kind of watch the markets. You got to watch market sediment. You got to watch what's actually playing out and, and and determine what what to do. The other thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, I am very outside the mainstream with my forecasts about the emergence of a new global mounder minimum, if you will. Uh, basically the theory that uh, our sun is going through a cycle of less sunspots, less solar activity, and the mechanism for how this can affect climate on Earth uh, is not uh, consistent with the current zeitgeist, which is calling for global warming. I'm actually looking for more cooling and more disruptive weather, uh, flooding, excessive rains, lower temperatures, shorter growing seasons. Um, one event does not make a trend, but a trend starts with one event. And this spring, I was right in the middle of the Corn Belt. I was fortunate to be there working on a job site and had to drive 30, 40, 50 miles back and forth to work each day. And I was just shocked with the lack of planting, the wet ground, the moisture, the continuous rain, the inability of farmers to get their corn crop in in a timely manner. And I think that uh, the USDA and a lot of the market participants are underestimating how bad the conditions are in the Corn Belt. Um, just from anecdotal evidence and talking to many farmers, I've talked to dozens of farmers. Um, now I was just in one location, but I've been following other locations. There's plenty of websites that you can find out uh, this information. But, uh, you know, the corn crop this year is not looking good. And I think this has several ramifications. This might be boring for some folks, but I think this is going to be something that you are going to be acutely aware of over the next years and possibly decades. Um, there are several books, one of which I will put a link to in the show notes, about what conditions were like and growing conditions and life conditions during the last mounder minimum in Europe and the description of the famines and the shorter growing seasons and the effect on agriculture on all types of uh, parts of life. Now, 
I would say that uh, if we are going to enter what I think is going to be a period of cooling, we're going to see shorter agricultural seasons, less yield, and that is not go going to be good for a large part of the population of the world because we're not just seeing it in the U.S., we're also seeing it in China and these other places. Um, some places will uh, obviously do better than others, but uh, corn, uh, I like to talk about it because it permeates a lot of of our food, um, especially in processed foods and in animal feeds. And we are seeing now, you know, if the price of feed goes up, that's going to push through into the price of um, animal proteins, chicken, beef, pork. So um, I think it needs to be bear watching. Like I said, one event does not make a trend, but it's, I'm going to be curious to see how as this corn crop develops, because not just the planting was was delayed but the conditions for growing have not been good subsequent to the planting to really get a good corn crop i mean they have certain um, temperature ranges that the corn has to be in to mature and to grow properly that doesn't seem to be happening in a lot of locations so i think that uh, one of the issues that's going to happen is to start to have the discussion about carryover stocks and what do i mean by that you know i think people have this view that we just have like five or ten years of you know supply in silos or in some big pile somewhere of, of all these grains and that's not really the case we have carryover stocks and and people uh, need to keep an eye on this because if those start to become depleted then the marginal buyer will set the price uh, for what uh, those those grains will cost and we could see a big price spike you know this could affect a lot of other things ethanol plants there might be a cutback corn gets too high, ethanol plants become less viable. Less ethanol means more um, gasoline demand, which means more oil demand. So there's a lot of feedback loops that can get affected here if this doesn't come in like, uh, like I think it might not. So it bears watching, not only from a financial perspective, but from a personal perspective. I mean, there's 8 million people on this planet. There's 80 to 90 million people being added every year, and there's less arable land. Now, our farmers have done a terrific job in adapting themselves with uh, new types of seeds and agricultural practices and all kinds of uh, fertilizer and nutrient inputs, but there's a limit to how far we can go. And I think this uh, bears watching. Uh, it's, I think, going to be a big surprise for people later this year. Going on with my agricultural theme, wanted to talk about the... Um, African swine flu in China and in Asia. You know, pork is a major protein source in Asia, in China, Vietnam, these types of places. Uh, and we've had this big outbreak of Asian, African swine flu, excuse me. And basically, African swine flu is a disease that's particular to hogs. It's not transmittable to people, but um, there's really no cure for it, no vaccine. So once this thing gets involved into the hog producing areas it has a tendency to uh, go kind of wild I mean we've already seen millions of hogs be destroyed in China and Vietnam with smaller outbreaks in other Asian countries um, you know we've got Chinese pork output could fall by up to 35 percent with prices for pork already up 40 percent uh, I don't know how this is actionable right now except for to say that uh, you know it could put an effect on corn as U.S. producers and other producers increase their pork uh, production to export. There's already been, I've read articles where Chinese, regardless of the tariffs, Chinese uh, buyers have been in the U.S. buying buying tons and tons of uh, pork products. So uh, there will be a demand. I think it's interesting to note about China. China has a real phobia about starvation. They've went through in their history, many, many famines where many, many people have died of starvation. So they have a big phobia about not having enough food. And this could be, you know, higher food prices, um, could be another catalyst or another uh, area that the Chinese Communist Party has to deal with that could, you know, make the regime a little bit more unstable or could force them to be put under further stress along with the trade talks. So it, another thing that bears watching, I mean, there's a lot of events sometimes or black swans or things that nobody sees coming that can affect um, what, uh, you know, events in such a way that could never be predicted. And this could be one of them. Like I said, I mean, 
This is not under control. I think it's being underreported in the West. And we've already seen this thing even spreading to areas like in Europe. There was a farm in Poland that this broke out on. So, you know, one of the one of the reasons that this thing takes off is that uh, in a lot of Chinese farms or a lot of farms, I, even when I uh, had a small pork operation, I was in high school, I used to raise uh, shoats and had some hogs. I used to swill feed them. And swill feeding is taking restaurant scraps or grocery scraps and feeding it to the hogs, and then you finish them on corn. It's a lot cheaper to use food waste. That's why a lot of cultures do, don't like to eat pork. I mean, a, I mean, a pig will eat just about anything you throw, any kind of slop you throw down it, whether it's old bread or wilted lettuce or you know buckets of you know table scraps from a restaurant. And that's where a lot of this disease can spread. You know, it's very hard to destroy this particular virus, even through cooking. And if uh, you get uh, contaminated meat products, pork products, mixed into the swill and you're feeding it to your hogs, you, you can, you can um, spread the disease. So I don't think this goes on too much in commercial farms here in the U.S., but I know in China it's a big problem. And like small producers, uh, it's a cheap way to, uh, to feed, it, feed uh, hogs until you decide to finish them on corn. So um, this is going to maybe be boring for some folks this week, but I think these are some things you've always got to be watching and looking at things uh, that could come out of left field, and all of a sudden they're not a big deal, and then, you know, until they are a big deal. And I think the corn thing is, I think, you know, with the solar minimum coming, there's going to be a lot of pressure on food prices, and they can be exacerbated by these type of ancillary uh, events that compound the problem, if you will. So short week this week, guys. Um, there was some talk on the Twitterverse uh, about some leak of the possible 232. I'm not going to comment on it. You can go on Twitter. Or you can go to the normal sources. I, I like to just wait till the actual uh, proclamation comes out from the Trump administration. And there's a lot of speculation out there. I don't, I don't want to get into too much speculation. Um, maybe it's just being lazy, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, what good does it do? It's just more, you know, mental masturbation and just sitting here, you know, what, you know, rubbing your hands together, what might happen, what could happen. I don't really operate like that. Let's see what comes out. I'm sure it'll be out here in the next few weeks, month or so. And then we'll all can analyze it and comment appropriately. Uh, so that's it this week, guys. Uh, thanks for the support. Look forward to talking to you in next week.